Norman Baker, The Profitable Windmills and the Growing Gap in Royal Wealth It is perilous for a monarchy to be disconnected from its people. The French Revolution of 1789 largely stemmed from the stark contrast between the opulent riches of King Louis XVI and his impoverished subjects. We are not on the brink of a revolution here in Britain, as the British tend to maintain their composure, as the French might say. However, there is a rising unease about the ever-widening chasm between the immense wealth of Charles EUI and the millions of ordinary Britons struggling to make ends meet. The issue at hand is not simply the fact that the royal family is incredibly wealthy, though they refuse to disclose the full extent of their riches. The problem lies in the fact that the British taxpayers have inadvertently set them on a path to even greater wealth, exacerbating the gap between them and their subjects, the taxpayers, in the process. Much has been said about King Charles' lucrative wind turbines situated offshore, which generate substantial revenue for him. However, it's essential to clarify that this is an oversimplification and a distortion. The windmills belong to private enterprises, the British state, and foreign states, not the king. The seabed is owned collectively, not by the king personally. The fact that we grant him a significant share of the profits is our own unfortunate doing, or at least the doing of former Chancellor George Osborne. Here's how it happened. In 2011, the civil list provided £7.9 million to the Queen for her official duties. In a disastrous move for the taxpayers, the system that had been in place for 251 years was replaced by Osborne, linking financial support for the royals to the income of the misnamed Crown Estates. These lands were handed over to the taxpayer in 1760, and in return, Parliament assumed the responsibility for funding matters that were previously covered by the King, such as the cost of the armed forces and civil service. There is no logical basis for linking the Crown Estates to the Royal's income. Lord Turnbull, a former cabinet secretary, aptly calls it silly. Moreover, it is a costly decision. As a highly successful property company, the Crown Estates regularly generates profits surpassing the inflation rate, effectively leading to a real terms pay increase for the Royals each year. The initial £7.9 million from 2011 has now ballooned to £86.3 million this year. To make matters worse, Osborne ensured that the money provided by taxpayers to the Royals can never decrease, even if the Crown Estate's profits were to underperform. However, it's not likely that the Crown Estates will underperform, as Britain now boasts the world's largest offshore wind complex, built on the Crown Estate's seabed. Consequently, a significant portion of the revenue that would have previously gone entirely to the taxpayer now has 25% diverted to the royals. Charles tried to preempt the backlash by announcing earlier in the year that he would return some of the funds to the state. But it's akin to Dick Turpin giving back a portion of his loot. Yet there's an even larger issue at play here. Thanks to the ever-increasing profits from the Crown Estates, Charles is set to receive a whopping 45% income increase from 2025, with the annual taxpayer contribution rising to £125 million. While authorities claim that the substantial increase from 2025 is intended to finance the refurbishment of Buckingham Palace, similar justifications were used for previous increases, and royal income never seems to decrease leaving no doubt that £125 million will become the new standard. And that doesn't even account for the £20 million plus profit Charles earns from the Duchy of Lancaster. His son, William, receives a similar sum from the Duchy of Cornwall, which is labeled as a private estate, but was previously a government department, with the proceeds going to the taxpayer. The generous subsidy from the Crown Estates does not consider the significant tax exemptions that the monarch and those close to him enjoy. Charles will pay no death duties on his racehorses, valuable paintings, £100 million stamp collections, or anything else he inherited directly from his mother, passed on from one monarch to another. For comparison, the annual costs of the Spanish and Swedish monarchies are £7 million and £6 million, respectively. One does not need to be a Republican to find this money-grabbing behavior outrageous. Charles talks about the monarchy tightening its belt, but when it comes to real money, there's little evidence of such prudence. 
he must reduce his reliance on public funds significantly, otherwise down the line, others might force him to do so. Dear friend, we try to publish the latest and hottest news. Please subscribe. Your support is very important to us.